Today I represent the two institutions that have come together to bring us our speaker, Professor Sotaro Kita. The Department of English of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University and the Hong Kong Hub of the International Society for Gesture Studies. In both institutions have got uh, calendars which are packed with talks and events for the coming months. So we certainly hope to be seeing you in some of those forthcoming talks. Um, keep, uh, if you, you should be in our mailing list if you're interested. If you're not in the mailing list, let us know or just link to us through the Twitter accounts, both the Department of English and ISGS Hong Kong, um, we're on Twitter. And for those of you who might not have heard of uh, ISGS uh, Hong Kong, we are an affiliated hub of the main International Society for Gesture Studies. We were set up last year and the, our main objective is to bring together gesture scholars in the area. And by the area, I mean the whole of Asia. So mm -hmm. if you're working around, uh, around Asia and you're interested in gestures or anything multimodality related, uh, please let us know. We will be very, very happy to hear from you. And just one, two, two quick things. Remember to keep your microphones muted throughout the talk. And if you have any questions or any comments, write them in the chat once you remember them, and then we will be addressing them at the very, very end of the talk. Professor Kita will be talking for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we're hoping to have 15 minutes of questions and answers. And uh, with that, let me pass the screen to um, another co-founder of the Hong Kong ISGS, Dr. Th Simon Harrison, who's going to be introducing Professor Kita. Thank you, Rina, and hello, everybody. Um, I just want to add on to one thing that Rina said there is that, yes, we are welcoming to scholars who are working in the Asia region on gesture, but also we're welcoming to scholars who or maybe from Asia and working on these topics or who are, are working on data that is collected here or is that is related to this context. So just to make sure that we cover everybody there who might be interested in taking part in our activities in this region. So now with that said, I would like to introduce today's speaker who is a pioneer in the area of gesture studies and that is Professor Satara Kita. So, Keita is Professor of Psychology of Language at the University of Warwick. His research focuses on spontaneous gestures and their relation to speech and cognition, as well as the development of communicative abilities in children. Keita received his PhD in Psychology and Linguistics from the University of, of Chicago as a student in the McNeil Lab. He then worked at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in Nijmegen for 10 years, first as a postdoc, and then as a senior, senior researcher leading the gesture project there. Keita's studies of gesture production, production and perception, spatial cognition and sound symbolism, to name some of his research topics, have been highly influential in shaping the field's cognitive, neuroscientific and cross-linguistic understandings of gesture. An example being his interface hypothesis model of speech and gesture published in the Journal of Memory and Language with Ashley Osherek. Keita is a former president of the International Society for Gesture Studies and since 2017 is the main editor of the peer-reviewed journal Gesture. I think a hub of the ISGS based in one of the many regions where Keita's work has had such a major impact, including his first book Gesture, the body that thinks, published in Japanese, would have been incomplete without his endorsement. Uh, this is why, Kita, we're so grateful that you accepted to be an honorary member of our hub way back last summer when we could be together in Nishinomiya and to open this semester's online seminar series for us with your latest research on the question, what do iconic gestures communicate to children? We'll be following this talk with a Q&A as Rina mentioned, but for the moment, please join me with a Zoom emoji, perhaps, of your choosing to welcome Professor Satara Kita for his talk. 
Over to you, Kita. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to um, uh, be able to present my work in this. Um, this is the first ISGS um, Hong Kong talk. Maybe not, not for this year, anyway. And, uh, and I'll be talking about um, my uh, recent research on um, iconic gestures and children. And, um, and I'd like to first acknowledge uh, three um, key collaborators for this talk. Uh, Dr. Kazuki Sekine, uh, who is an as associate professor at Waseda University in Japan. Suzanne Osams, uh, assistant professor at University of Warwick and my former PhD student, Catherine Mumford, who is a speech language therapist in Canada now. Today, I'm going to, talk about, uh, I'm going to be talking about so-called iconic gestures. Um, and this is one of the major categories of gestures that people spontaneously produce uh, when they speak. And uh, I mean, th there are many different kinds of gestures, but iconic gestures are of the following characteristics they depict uh, action and action, motion and shape, and, and also uh, the form of iconic gestures resembles the referent. That's why uh, it's called iconic gestures. Uh, it com comes from uh, Persian semiotics, iconicity um, uh, as the base for its name. Um, and what, 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 what's been noted about iconic gestures is that they often convey extra information not found in the accompanying speech. So for example, um, so this is a demonstration of how iconic gesture and speech complement each other in terms of meaning. And um, so if you see a gesture like this, um, he's throwing, is the speech, and that this person does this gesture. And um, and if you're <coughs> um, and if you're told uh, if you're asked what event is she trying to convey, and there if you have four options, uh, throwing a baseball, throwing a basketball, opening a door with two hands, taking a photo, and uh, you would say that the uh, um, you know if you think about both information in the speech and gesture, throwing basketball is the right answer. Okay. That's what the, uh, the speaker is trying to convey. So, uh, so this is an example of how speech and gesture can be integrated to convey um, uh, information. Um, so, so this talk explores uh, communicative functions of such core speech gestures, core speech iconic gestures. Um, and I'll be talking about um, experiments that investigated how uh, iconic gestures communicate information to children. And, um, and there have been a lot of research in the literature about how iconic gestures communicate. And uh, the main sort of key finding has been that the recipients pick up information encoded in gesture and integrated with information from speech. And uh, people often call this sort of phenomena speech gesture integration. And uh, there have been lots of uh, research that uh, investigate the nature of this integration. Um, but I think there's, uh, but, but I'd like to point out limitations in uh, such previous studies. So previous studies mainly focused on uptake of encoded information in gesture, gesture that uh, information that is directly expressed in gesture, that's been the focus. And also uh, people have focused really on integration of information between speech and gesture. Um, so, so I think uh, in, a, in today's talk, I'd like to go beyond this sort of uh, uh, confines that are uh, prevalent in previous research. So, um, in order to figure out the meaning um, of what people said or what people gestured, so, so for speech, you can use four meaning convention 
that are established in a given language. So each word has a conventional meaning, sort of a core meaning. Um, so you can, uh, you can rely on this uh, four meaning conventions if you're trying to uh, understand what people said. But iconic gestures cannot rely on this type of conventions because iconic gestures are created on the spot and uh, people have to interpret the information mm, as they come in. So, so for iconic gestures, the meaning has to be constructed on the spot. Um, and um, and in order to uh, in order to derive meaning from icon meaning of iconic gestures, you have to of course think about the um, movement hand movement and what that might represent, but also you need to take into account uh, context, the physical context and conceptual context. Iconic gesture needs to be mapped mapped onto action or spatial information in the physical world, if the referent of the gesture is physically present. Uh, or the conceptual world, if the referent is not physically present. So for iconic gestures, it's really important to think about three-way integration process. Speech, iconic gesture, and the physical or conceptual world. And the previous research has really focused on this speech gesture integration, uh, the top uh, integration between the top two are parts of this figure, uh, but uh, what I would like to emphasize today is that the iconic gestures also need to be integrated with the world, physical or conceptual. So, so plan of the talk is the following. Um, so we will look at various communicative functions of iconic gestures with experiments with children. Um, in the first study, um, I will show that iconic gesture communicates the encoded information, the information encoded in the gesture. Um, and, uh, and this um, helps children to learn the meaning of new word, that's study one. So this study one is within this sort of classic paradigm of speech gesture integration study. Uh, but the, the key point is of today is that the iconic gestures communicate more than that. So when the referent of an iconic gesture is present in the physical world, word gesture integration leads to sort of surprising communicative effects in study two, we will show that iconic gestures, uh, iconic gesture guides the recipient attentions to a particular part of part of a scene. So it's almost like a didactic gesture, that, a pointing gesture that directs people's attention to a particular area in the scene. Iconic gesture would do the same. And in study three, uh, we show that the uh, iconic gesture generates abstract knowledge beyond what is encoded in the gesture. And, um, and in study four, I will show that the uh, world gesture integration may be more difficult for children um, when the world is a conceptual world than when it is a physical world. So these are the kind of studies, uh, four studies I'd like to talk about today. So the first study is that the gesture shapes uh, verb meaning uh, for children. And this is a study done with uh, Catherine Mumford. <clears throat> so the children take up the information encoded in iconic gesture to infer the meaning of a novel word. So in this study, uh, we taught novel words to three-year-olds, okay, so we're here. And, um, <clears throat> and at the same time, they, uh, these children saw an action event on a computer screen as a video. Um, so we showed them a video, we taught them a verb that refers to that action, and then we asked children to generalize the verb to a new scene. And crucially, we, we set up the uh, situation in which the verb was ambiguous. So the verb could be interpreted as a manner verb, a verb that refers to a manner of action or the end state. 
And, um, and when we, so we taught them this ambiguous verb, but uh, when we taught the verb, uh, the verb was accompanied by either a manner gesture or end state gesture or no gesture. Right? And this was a, a between subject, a between participant manipulation. So, so children were assigned to one of these three groups. So I will demonstrate uh, how it looked like. So for example, <clears throat> so this is the uh, learning phase uh, video. And the experimenter would say, look, she's blinking it. Look, she's blinking it. And note that the, the, the verb blink is ambiguous here. It could mean placing objects in this with this particular manner. But it could also mean creating this, you know, stripey uh, end state. And uh, depending on the group they were assigned to, uh, so mana gesture group would see a gesture like this. Look, she's blinking it. Look, she's blinking it. And the uh, uh, end state gesture group would see uh, end state demonst uh, depiction of the end, end state in the gesture. Look, she's blinking it. Look, she's blinking it. Okay. And then no gesture group didn't see any gestures uh, during the, uh, during the uh, teaching phase. And then at the test phase, uh, children were asked to interpret, um, well, extend the verb to a new scene. So which one's blinking it? And then they saw these two videos. So one video will have the same manner as before, but the end state is different. And this choice had the same manner, uh, sorry, different manner, which creates the same end state. So if the child interpret black to be a change of state verb, then they should choose the one on the left. If the child interpreted Blick to be a mana verb, then they should choose the one, uh, the video to the right. Okay. And uh, the kind of gestures that they saw during the teaching phase really made a difference in children's interpretation of these uh, new verbs. <clears throat> so this graph shows the y axis proportion of mana choice. So they did this uh, several times, and the proportion of time, a proportion of trials in which they chose mana is uh, is the y-axis. Uh, X-axis shows uh, what kind of gestures they saw in the training phase. So children who saw the mana gesture during the training are more likely to choose mana than those who saw an end state gesture or no gesture. So. So children took up information encoded in iconic gesture that experiment are presented, and they integrated this gesture information uh, with the novel word, and then assigned uh, the me a particular meaning to the novel word um, by uh, through this process of um, uh, speech gesture integration. <laughs> So that was a study that um, is in a sort of more, more classical paradigm of speech gesture integration. And in study two, which um, I carried out with Susanna Osems, uh, goes a little bit beyond that. Uh, so this study um, investigated um, a, a little bit different kind of uh, uh, communicative function of iconic gestures. So this is an attention guiding function of um, um, iconic gestures. So when somebody draws your attention to an iconic gesture and an event, um, you, in that kind of situation, you look for the part of the event that matches the gesture. Okay? And this in effect guides the recipient's attention to that part of the, uh, that part of the event. So the basic idea is to present three-year-olds with uh, 12 human locomotion events with or without iconic gesture depicting, depicting how the actor moved, the manner of movement. 
an iconic gesture. And there are three kinds of iconic gestures. In one type, the gesture represented the uh, actor's feet movement. Uh, in the other second type of gestures, um, a gesture represented the um, movement of the legs. And then in other gestures, the, uh, the hand depicted the whole body, how the whole body moved. And, um, and after this sort of, uh, <clears throat> so first we show them uh, these videos and people walking in different ways with or without iconic gestures. And then we tested if the child can recognize the action uh, in some tests. And in other tests, we, te uh, we checked whether uh, children can recognize the actors from these two 12 videos. And I'm going to show you the 12 videos. Um, so for example, this is one example. So this particular actor doing this funny way of walking. And we would say, wow, look at what she's doing. Look at what she's doing. And then here's another one. Look, look what he's doing. Look what he's doing. So we have, we repeat this 12 times with different kinds of uh, manner of motion with different actors. So these 12 videos, all different manners movement, 12 different uh, um, actors or actresses. And the type of gestures we produced, so there were three kinds of gestures. So hand as foot gesture goes like this. So, th so this is the event. And for that, the experimenter said, look what she's doing. Look at what she's doing. And produce this kind of gesture. In the second type of gesture, the hand represents the leg movement. Look what he's doing. And then in the third type of gestures, the hand represents the whole body. So this is the locomotion event. And then the experimenter says, look at what she's doing. So note that in this gesture, the whole hand represents the whole body of the, um, uh, of the actress. And then, so after watching 12 videos like that, with or without gesture, <clears throat> um, they had a recognition test. Which video did you see before? That was the test, okay. So in the actor test, they saw two videos. So in these two videos, the manner of movement is the same. But one of the actors actually, one of the video was actually shown in the, uh, in, in the learning phase. And, uh, and this man with this manner of movement was shown in the learning phase, but not the one on the, on the right. So, so in order to get this test right, you have to recognize the actor. So that's the actor test. Action test. Okay, so in this test, the same actor who actually showed up in the learning phase do two different things. But this action on the right is something he did not do in the, um, um, uh, in, the uh, in the learning phase. So in order to get this right, you have to remember the actual action. Okay. So to recap, um, so this was a two by three by two design. Uh, the type of gesture that they saw uh, during the testing, uh, whether they saw iconic gestures or no gesture, and then there were different kind of gestures, uh, hand representing feet, hand representing legs, hand representing body, and then we had two types of tests, action memory test, actor memory test.
So the idea here was that the, um, <clears throat> so first, uh, those who saw iconic gesture should have a good action memory because all iconic gestures represented action. So, but more interesting prediction was that the, uh, those who saw the uh, body representing gestures, whole body gesture, whole body representation of gestures should have a better actor memory because this whole body gesture draws attention to the whole uh, body of the actor, which leads to, um, then you would remember the actor a better. And that's what we found. So y-axis is the uh, recognition memory performance. Um, <clears throat> so how many of these tests did they get it right? And because it was a two-way false choice, 50% uh, is the uh, chance level. And, um, and left-hand panel is the action memory test. Right-hand panel is the actor memory test. And uh, light green is iconic gesture group children who saw iconic gestures. Uh, dark blue is no gesture group, children who didn't see any gesture. And then gesture semiotics, body, feet, legs, body, feet, legs. So first let's look at the uh, left side, right, left hand panel. Um, so action memory was better in the iconic gesture group than no gesture group. And uh, there was no difference between uh, different gesture semiotics. All gestures represented action, the amount of movement, and children did better. So maybe that's, so that's a very nice result, but maybe less surprising. What's surprising is the actor memory result. So only the body gesture led to a very good memory of the actor. Feet and legs, leg gestures, uh, so the, for, for these, um, type of gest iconic gestures, there was no difference between the two groups, iconic gesture group, no gesture group. Only in the body gesture, uh, seeing iconic gesture had an, uh, had an advantage. And what is important to remember here is that the uh, gesture itself did not in express any information about the actor. Okay. So, so important conclusion from here is that the first encoded information in iconic gesture helped children to recognize manner of locomotion. That was the left-hand side of the graph, action memory. And the most surprising part was the right-hand side of the result about the actor memory. Though iconic gesture did not include any information about the actor, when gestures depicted the whole body, children remember the actor better. So the way we interpret this result is that children's attention was guided to the actor's whole body by the gesture. And then uh, that led to better memory for distinctive features of actors, for example, clothing, hairstyle, or the face. So, so what this tells us, this actor memory result tells us is that the uh, world gesture integration guides attention of people to a particular part of the scene. In the third study, I'd like to talk about um, iconic gesture creating abstract knowledge. So this is a paper that just came out. Uh, this is a paper with uh, Susanna Awesomes. Um, <clears throat> so when you see iconic gestures, you know, stance demonstration where uh, there is a referent um, present in the physical world, and uh, you need to abstract out the information in the world that matches the gesture schema. So, um, and such abstraction may lead to more abstract knowledge. So this is again a situation in which uh, we teach three-year-olds new verbs, um, and then uh, children will be watching video of the referent action. So this is an ostensive situation where the referent is in front, right in front of the child. So we taught three year olds novel locomotion verbs with or without iconic gestures depicting the referent. And uh, so this is a situation in which they see a gesture, but at the same time, there is a video that includes the referent. 
And, um, and after this learning phase, we test, uh, we tested if the iconic gesture helped them to extend, uh, help them to understand, uh, help them to learn the uh, manner for individual verb that we taught. But also we had another more challenging test for children in which uh, they had to um, <clears throat> learn verbs that they, a new set of verbs uh, without any help from iconic gesture. And then they have to learn that, that these verbs um, also refer to uh, manner of motion. So they had to learn kind of a more general knowledge that the verbs in this task refer to manner of motion. So to give you a bit more concrete idea of how the experiment went, uh, so this is the training of verb learning phase, uh, training phase, and the experimenter would say, look, he's blinking. Wow, look, he's blinking again. Yeah. And depending on the condition, uh, depending on the group, some children would see an iconic gesture that uh, depicts this um, manner of move, movement like this. And then in the test phase, they were asked, which one is blinking? And in one video, you see the same person doing something else. In the other video, you see a different person doing the same manner of movement. And it's been known in the literature that three-year-old find this task really difficult because one has a action match, the other one has actor match. And three-year-olds often think that the both actor and action are equally important for verbs. And uh, they, they fail to focus on the manner. And in this experiment, um, we had, um, <coughs> two manipulation. One is uh, block one and block two. I will explain that uh, in a minute. Um, several trials in block one in which we manipulated the kind of gestures they see. And in block two, that's a kind of a generalization uh, trials in which they have to uh, solve verb learning problem without the help of iconic gestures. And then we have two groups of children First group of children saw iconic gestures in block one, but interactive gestures that is uh, interactive with the children, but didn't say anything about the amount of movement in block two. And then the second group of children uh, saw interactive gestures throughout. So to, to sort of visually present this, <coughs> the first row is the iconic gesture group. So in the training, they saw iconic gesture, look, she's blinking, and then we saw, uh, she, they saw a gesture that depicts the manner, and they got tested, who, which one's blinking. And, and then uh, this group saw um, interactive gesture. This is like a wow, like a sh showing it's like a surprise or amazement, but doesn't tell you anything about the manner. You know, wow, she's taxing, it's a new item. And then they have to do this test, which one is taxing, okay? This is a mana match, this is an acta match. So this is iconic gesture training group. Uh, interactive, no iconic gesture group, just had this um, interactive gesture throughout. We had a few different kinds of interactive gestures. Um, so our prediction was that the children would learn the verb taught with iconic gesture better. So that's a block one. But also we predict that the, that the uh, children who saw iconic gesture should actually acquire general knowledge that the uh, verbs in this task refer to manner. Therefore, they do well in block two as well. Okay. And that's what we found. So proportion of verb, correct verb generalization so um, they generalize the verb uh, according to the manner of movement. And, uh, and this is block one, where iconic gesture group, 
which is pink. So iconic gesture and um, interactive gesture group. So interactive gesture. And in block two, everybody saw an interactive gesture. And uh, what you see is that the uh, um, interactive gesture group could not really do this task well, uh, which is uh, compatible with the literature. The three-year-olds find this task really difficult. Uh, but iconic gesture group did significantly better in block one, but also more surprisingly in block two, where they didn't get any help for, from iconic gesture for individual uh, uh, verbs. So what this means is that they learned something more general. They, well, they learned each verb better in block one with, with the help of iconic gesture. And then they created an abstract knowledge that, oh yeah, verbs are about actions. And then they used that abstract knowledge in the second half and continue to do better than the other group. So, so what this shows is that encoded information and iconic gesture help children to focus on the action. Okay, so this is a block one first part. So encoded information got conveyed to the children. That's good. But what's really interesting is that the word learning with iconic gesture led to abstract knowledge that verbs in these tasks uh, refer to actions. Uh, so what this means is that the word gesture integration uh, promoted this uh, generation of this kind of abstract knowledge in children. So, so, so far we saw examples, uh, the demonstration that three-year-olds can integrate information in iconic gesture and the physical world. Uh, how about the conceptual world? And uh, so here I'd like to sort of uh, step back and think about different kinds of world that uh, iconic gesture could be interacting with. So we've been looking at um, the physical world, the red one at the bottom, and uh, but there is also a conceptual world, which is the blue one at the top. And then there is some kind of in-between world where uh, physical world and conceptual worlds are blended. And I'll, I'll explain what this means in a minute. Um, but iconic gesture interact with, uh, need to be integrated with all these three kinds of worlds. Okay. So, so far, um, we saw a demonstration that the iconic gestures can be integrated with the physical world and that leads to sort of interesting communicative effects. Uh, in the next study, I'd like to show you an example of how iconic gestures can work with a blend of physical and conceptual world. So this is a study that we did, uh, that I did with uh, Kazuki Sekine. So children's understanding of gestural discourse cohesion. Okay. The question is whether children can understand gestural discourse cohesion. <clears throat> I explain what that means in a minute. Um, so this is a situation in which there are no physical reference of iconic gesture present. So iconic gestures all represent sort of imaginary events in this uh, experimental paradigm. Um, but the uh, referent can be inferred from concurrent speech and from the location of iconic gesture in gesture space. So exactly where in gesture space iconic gesture is uh, produced uh, gives you extra information. Okay. Um, so uh, often in gesture, people place a particular concept in a particular location and, it, and people keep using that location to index uh, um, uh, what concept uh, uh, they're referring to. And, uh, and this kind of use of gesture space can be seen as a blend of physical and conceptual spaces. So you have these two concepts that are not physically there, but physically uh, indexed uh, by, uh, by, by in the gesture space. So we're going to see a case like this in the next experiment. <clears throat> so these are Japanese speaking uh, 
five-year-olds, six-year-olds, 10-year-olds, and adults. And we presented a three-sentence discourse. In the first two sentences, iconic gestures associated two protagonists of a story in, on the left on the, and on the right. And in sentence three, uh, sentence three states that something happened to one of the protagonists, but the sentence does not identify the protagonist. Uh, so uh, uh, because Japanese does not have to actually uh, explicitly say the subject noun phrase. And, uh, but this sentence was accompanied by an iconic gesture depicting what happened, either on the, ref, or on the, on, on the right or the left uh, gesture space. And then participants were asked which participant was involved in sentence three. Okay. So this gives you a bit more concrete idea of what we did. <clears throat> the original stimuli were in Japanese, but uh, this is English translation. Nao and Yuto are uh, boys' names. So now and Yuto are crossing the pedestrian bridge. So that this is the first sentence. And as we, as the, um, um, and this was presented by video. And uh, this uh, actor in the video produced a gesture that locate now one, one, uh, one of the boys on this space. So number two and three, picture number two and three is when she said now, and then Yuto was set up on, uh, on the opposite side of the gesture space, okay? So now and Yuto are crossing pedestrian bridge, number two, three, four, five. And then now, again, this hand gets activated and Yuto, this hand, are going up the stairs. Then suddenly one tumbles down, which is tumbles down is the gesture here. And then children are asked, or what our participants were asked, did now or Yuto tumble down? That was the experiment. And, uh, and adults, so this is uh, a proportion of correct choice and the different groups of children, uh, uh, participants. And adults were near perfect in this task. And there is an age um, related uh, uh, development for this task. And five year olds were a chance um, they were at random in picking the uh, protagonists. <clears throat> so it looks like five-year-olds are really struggling with this task. And in order to probe exactly what the problem is, maybe this three-sentence discourse is too much. Maybe five-year-olds cannot keep track of which side is whom. Um, so we did an experiment in which <clears throat> Um, they, we, we kept the complexity of the task more or less the same, but they don't need to do this world gesture integration as much. They don't need to construct the meaning of iconic gestures through integration with gesture space. Uh, in order to achieve that, we used pictures instead of gesture in the stimulus. Okay. Unlike gestures, pictures can be interpreted on their own, uh, so you don't need to uh, generate meaning based on speech and the gesture space. So this is how the experiment looked like. Same, uh, same speech, but instead of using gestures, we use these pictures, handheld pictures. So here, uh, there are two different boys on you know, either side of the, uh, the, that. So this is one boy, then this is another boy. They have different hairstyle, different clothing. <clears throat> And then uh, crucially, when we show, when we produce the gesture for tumbling down, you cannot see the picture of the boys. And then we ask, did now or you to tumble down? So in this task, five-year-olds were near perfect. So, so this discourse was not too complex. They can keep track of who's on which side. The, the difficulty they had must have been uh, generating meaning of gestures when, um, when the actor went now and you tell. So generating meaning of this, uh, this abstract gesture, uh, you know, with the help of speech and the gesture space, that, you know, speech world gesture integration uh, that children couldn't really do.
So, so what this means is that the five-year-olds cannot construct the meaning of an iconic gesture through uh, integration with a gesture space and speech. So they couldn't do this three-way uh, integration. So what this means is that the, um, uh, even though we've seen a couple of examples of three-year-olds managing to integrate an iconic gesture with the physical world, uh, even five-year-olds find it difficult to integrate iconic gesture with physical and conceptual world um, combination. So how about um, iconic gesture with conceptual world integration? So that's something I'm not going to talk about because more studies are needed. We haven't done uh, studies that directly address this issue. Um, so it'd be interesting to look at um, how uh, adults and children integrate iconic gestures with a conceptual world, such as events in episodic memory. So events, not the events that you see right in front of you on computer screen, but events that you remember from the past, uh, or maybe generic or semantic knowledge of the world and how that interact with the iconic gesture. Um, and then perhaps metaphorical space not the space left and right that you see in front of you, but metaphorical space that you need to create in your mind. Okay. <clears throat> and I think the study of uh, this sort of purely conceptual world is very important because uh, uh, Gabriela Villioka's lab have dem demonstrated that the, when, a, when an adult interacts with a child, the adult produces more iconic gestures when the referent is not physically present. Than when it is present. So, so iconic gestures are especially important when, um, um, when, uh, when the referent is not there. So I think we need to investigate more of this uh, kind of situation. Okay. So let me summarize what we, I've talked about. So the key point today is that the, there is a three-way, we have to really think about a three-way integration process, not just speech and gesture, but speech, gesture, and the world. And gestures, communicative function goes beyond conveying encoded information. That was uh, one point. Another important point was that gesture world integration leads to various unexpected communicative effects. So, so we saw that the iconic gestures encode, encoded the referent of a novel verb. Uh, this is the first experiment we talked about, and uh, this is this indicates that the children can deal with this. They they understand this uh, kind of function of iconic gestures. And in the second experiment, we saw that the iconic gestures guided recipients' action, attention, and boosted memory for actors. Even though these gestures did not uh, encode any information about actors, the whole body gesture. Uh, guided our children's attention to actors, so children could do that. And then in the third study, we saw that iconic gestures generated new abstract knowledge about verb meaning, uh, and children can do that. In the fourth experiment, <coughs> iconic gestures got meaning from the physical gesture space. Uh, Five-year-olds really struggled to do this, uh, but older children and adults could do this. So the take home message today is that the recipient um, integrates iconic gesture with physical and conceptual world, as well as uh, with speech. And iconic gesture communicates more than its encoded information. So that's my take home message. And I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators again. And uh, if you're interested in where you can read about these studies, uh, these are the references. So that's it from me.